this is Mark Rosen from WCCO-TV, and it's my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Ron Henderson, the Fitness King, presenting Motivation, one word to help change your life. Have you ever had a time in your life when you thought about maybe becoming a police officer or getting involved in law enforcement? Well, on today's Motivation, I have the great pleasure of introducing to you the Chief of Police of Minneapolis, Chief Rondo. Welcome to Motivation. Pleasure to meet you and How thank you for you? having me. I'm doing wonderful today. Right. Okay, Absolutely. I'm really excited about you being on the show today. Thank you. I know you have a very busy schedule. Okay? Yes, yes, All but right. I'm happy to be here. Thank, thank you, you for thank having you. me. Thank you, it's an honor. Yeah. And on that note, I want to get right to what I always do. I okay. like to ask people these weird questions to kind of break the ice. Certainly. Uh, you're the Chief of Police, but you're also a human being. That's right. Okay. That's right. Is there anything about you that most people in Minneapolis especially don't know about you that you'd like to share? I'm a music junkie. Okay. I <laughs> love music, um, whether uh, buying and purchasing new music, certainly listening, but also going to see live music. Okay. So I really like to support local music, live music here in the Twin okay. Cities. Any so. favorites of Minneapolis? Any groups that are your favorites? Well, I've, uh, all, all genres, uh, but there's just so much good music that's taking place right now, and has been for many decades here in, in the cities, but uh, yep. I really I really enjoy live music. Yeah. Okay, me too, me too. Yes, <laughs> all right, good. All right, now let's get to the meat of the matter. Okay, <laughs> say. all right. Uh, when did you get involved in law enforcement and why? Um, my career with the Minneapolis Police Department started back in 1989. Mm -hmm. um, what led me to even pursue law enforcement um, was really this idea of service that was nurtured down from my parents mm -hmm. to all of uh, uh, the nine siblings of mine. Okay. And so mm -hmm. service was really an integral part of uh, growing up and uh, family mm -hmm. and, and, and community. And so um, being a product of Minneapolis, when the opportunity came uh, after going to school to study for criminal justice law enforcement, um, I thought, what a better way than to give back to uh, my city in serving right here in Minneapolis. So, right. so I'm very fortunate that I'm allowed to be able to uh, grow up in the same city that I have an opportunity to give service back to. Yes, yes. And you have nine siblings. Any, you have brothers, mostly brothers or all sisters? Um, actually, it's half and half. Okay. It's half and half. Um, no immediate family members of mine were in law enforcement, so um, growing up uh, as an African-American young uh, kid in the cities, uh, I didn't see a whole lot of, of uh, officers that looked like me. Right. Uh, the ones that um, I do recall, um, you know, the late great Monty Manning, oh, of course, great yeah. Riley Gilchrist, oh, yeah. Riley, good friend um, of mine. and uh, uh, Larry Wakefield, and uh, there were just so many of the uh, uh, Bill Jones, who uh, I believe was our first department's first deputy chief, African American deputy chief, um, but so many, so many that uh, kind of paved the way. Uh, and also uh, from over across the river in St. Paul, um, deputy chief uh, Griffith yeah, to Corky. to, to yeah. absolutely uh, chief Finney, uh, certainly uh, still chief right now of Metro Transit, John Harrington. Yep. Uh, yep. So anyway, yep. there was a lot of inspiration and, and uh, mentors uh, mm -hmm. for me. So I was fortunate. Good. How has the role of chief of police affected your family. Has there been any, you know, I, you know, it's good a, and bad. it's a, it's a busy job. Mm -hmm. uh, the schedule is quite mm -hmm. busy. Um, my, my kids are uh, young adults now, so I think that that helps. Um, but um, everything that uh, I do, I mean, certainly public safety right now, uh, more so probably than ever in our history. Mm -hmm. um, there's a spotlight on it, and so good, bad, or indifferent. Mm -hmm. uh, that gets played out, and mm -hmm. certainly as my kids, um, there may be people that have their, their views one way or the other that may be uh, different from theirs, right. mm -hmm. and so you don't want your kids feeling like they have to defend you uh, and your decisions all the time, but, right. uh, uh, but they have always been very supportive of the work that I do, um, and so, uh, and they have their, uh, I mean, they're young adults, they have their own minds sure. and their opinions as well, and so, uh, I, I listen uh, to them as well, and mm -hmm. I'm someone that likes to take counsel from all different sources, including smart, my children. Smart, smart, So, so yeah. So it's been, uh, it's been good. Good. It's been good. Being aware of uh, racial tensions, and especially in Minneapolis and different other parts of the cities too, as well. But uh, what are you doing on what are, from your from your viewpoint? What are you doing as chief of police to maybe help curb, you know, sort of lessen those things and are people expecting you, as an African-American, 
to be able to do more? That's a great question. Um, what I have seen and what I have seen historically with policing, uh, policing in this country and certainly here in Minneapolis, um, police have been used oftentimes as a uh, instrument of government when uh, there have been social hot button issues and racism has yep. been one of those. Mm -hmm. If we can think back uh, in terms of civil rights movement in this country, uh, many of us uh, can visualize those black and white real footage of officers, whether they were in Selma, whether they were in Birmingham, mm -hmm. um, or whether they were in uh, Detroit or Oakland mm -hmm. after the assassination of Dr. King. Yes. Police mm -hmm. have always uh, kind of been that uh, very visual, uh, visible face of government. Mm -hmm. um, and race has always seemed to be uh, very prevalent. And, and uh, a lot of the uh, challenges and a lot of the opportunities that we have in policing, that's not uh, any different uh, today. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. uh, many of uh, the high profile police shootings that we've experienced uh, here locally and across the country have brought that subject of race and police community relations uh, that is still very prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, what I try to do on, on two ends is one, I try to learn as much as I can about the current state of where people are, what people are feeling right now in the community. Uh, but I also, I think it's important for me to equip our officers uh, with certain tools. And some of those tools include learning about implicit bias, something that we all have. Right. Um, and uh, implicit bias isn't something that to say that you're uh, right. racist, sure. but it's recognizing that uh, we all have certain programming, oh, yeah. and it's important for officers to make sure that when we have inter interactions or encounters with our community, that it's based upon uh, what we call Minneapolis Police Department procedural justice. Yes. Ensuring that we give people voice, treating them with respect, being neutral in those interactions, mm -hmm. and building trustworthy spaces. Um, if we can do that and focus on that, and that's evidence-based, by the way, um, officers are more likely to be healthy and well when they mm -hmm. come to work. Community members are more likely to cooperate with police. Yeah. And support police, And support too. police. Yeah. And so that's, those are the conversations and the trainings that um, uh, I really want to continue to, to build mm -hmm. and strengthen within our, uh, the Minneapolis Police Department. Yes. How do you, how do you get police officers to I mean, do you have more hours of training on those things, on dealing with that, so they don't let the what I call the the men e the male ego get in their way? Yeah. I mean, how do you? How, and 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 is the training different now than what it was, let's say, 25 years ago? Are they doing better? Yeah, the training is, right. is vastly different. It's right. it certainly, um, I believe, it's much more better. Uh, training you always wanted to at least uh, be timely and relevant, um, meaningful as well. Uh, the training that we get today, for example, we do a lot of work on de-escalation. Yeah. Um, years of policing uh, on days gone by, it was about get in there quick mm -hmm. and resolve the situation. Right, right. Uh, what we have found is that that can lead to injury and risk, not only to the officers, but to the, uh, the public at large. Uh, it can also cause for consternation and oh, yeah. ill feelings mm -hmm. um, um, in, in those encounters that we have. Uh, but de-escalation is key, the implicit bias training is certainly important. Uh, we're doing a lot more, and I know this is certainly in your, your bailiwick, mm -hmm. health and wellness. Oh, important. For, for years, uh, we knew that uh, many in our community suffer from historical and current day trauma mm -hmm. and the impacts that, that has on them. Well, we never took the time to do a deep dive to think about officers going to call, to call, to call, to call, right. that have trauma as a result of it, mm -hmm. what that does to the individual. Oh, yeah. uh, so wellness training, um, um, uh, nutrition, all right. of these things uh, right. to, to make sure that our, our, our folks are, you know, in order for them to, uh, to do their best, they have to be at their best. So health, wellness is very important. I agree. From a, from a let's say, as an officer, from a, a self-defense standpoint, has training improved for police officers now compared to 20 years ago? And the reason I ask this, because as somebody who spent a, long, a lot of years in security work, yeah. I found that the, the better a person could handle themselves, and I asked you this before the show yeah. as well, the less likely they were to just to get physical with people. Has that changed at all in the last 20 years or since she came out? Are they, are they doing more to, to train people how to be better at handling themselves as police officers? So they have built up their own confidence. Yeah, confidence is, is, is very important in the training that uh, uh, 
we receive. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps uh, in terms of your, your, your presence. We, in policing, use the term command presence, right. mm -hmm. uh, which really cuts to the core of your, your confidence yes. and being aware and confident of your skills, what you do well, but what you're also limited at. Right. And mm -hmm. we don't want officers to rely upon a set of skills where they're diminished in that. Exactly. Um, so that certainly uh, helps communication. We really are trying to teach our officers more about interpersonal communication, reading body language. Right. Uh, and of course, de-escalation is a big part of that. So the training, I believe, has, has been much more um, robust and much more uh, attuned to what um, is important for those officers as they have their interactions uh, day to day out okay. there. And is there ongoing training even right now for the officers that are already on the department? Uh, yes. You know, one of the things that's very fortunate about Minneapolis uh, Police Department is uh, the state of Minnesota has their uh, required training through the right. Post Board Post, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. Peace Officer Standards and Training Board, which uh, ensures the licenses for officers. Uh, so there's a minimum requirement that uh, departments around the, the state have to to fulfill the post requirements. Minneapolis, we're, we're fortunate that uh, we have the largest department in the state where mm -hmm. we can offer additional training. So whether it's on health and wellness, whether it's on um, uh, uh, de-escalation, uh, crisis intervention training, mm -hmm. uh, how we uh, interact and engage with uh, those uh, in our mental health communities. Mm -hmm. And so, so though we, yeah, we're very fortunate that we add to the training that's required as well. Good. Uh, I didn't mention this before the show, but when it comes to let's say school safety, yeah. what do you what are, have you guys thought about that? And how you're going to deal with those situations, and what are you doing? Yeah, in preparation. So, yeah, so we uh, have school resource officers at uh, uh, our local area high schools, as well as some of our middle schools, and, and then some of our elementary schools. And their key role is to uh, to be there to build relationships with the school community, the administrators, yeah. Yeah. the staff, mm -hmm. uh, the, the students, and the parents. Um, but we also know, in light, sadly, of some of the um, horrific shooting uh, incidents right. that have occurred uh, in, in our schools around the country, uh, we know that we need to also be able to train to respond in the event uh, we get that, that bad call. Right. And so we do stay on top of that and we do continue to train in the event we have to respond uh, to such a dire situation. Um, so we try to, to, to marry both building those positive relationships right, right. with the schools, but also we're there for public safety. Sure, and, and has that, let me, if I can, has that increased since the recent shooting as well? Y yes, uh, as, as, as far as your training on that. Yeah, you. as as chief, it's important for me to stay attuned to uh, some of the incidents that occur uh, and to make sure that we're staying on top of that. So mm -hmm. whether it's uh, the uh, horrific Las Vegas shooting or more recently the Park Lawn, Florida school shooting, uh, it's important for me to, to make sure that our, sure. our folks who command our tactical teams um, are up to speed in what they need in terms of training, that they have the proper supplies and tools, and that as a department, because the reality is that if, if in fact a situation like that should occur, it's probably more likely going to be the men and the women responding in squad cars or it might be the school resource officer, right. uh, that they uh, have the adequate training that they need to, to respond if they have to. Okay. Uh, in lieu of, you know, uh, comments on, you see the media, body cams and all this stuff, okay? Yep. I know that can that can affect people. They're getting out there, they know everything's being recorded. Yep. What, are you, what are you guys doing right now from the standpoint of trying to help improve the morale for the police department as well? Because you want people out there that have a good attitude about what they're doing. Yeah, so whenever we have a situation within the organization where uh, it might be new technology or, mm -hmm. or new policies, uh, we really try to communicate that messaging uh, that it's for the betterment of the, the officers. Right. Um, so whether it comes to body cameras, um, you know, the valuable tool they are in terms of uh, recording engagements with the community, uh, evidence that it can pick up and, and, and gather and, and uh, obtain. Um, it has exonerated uh, officers uh, mm -hmm. when false allegations have occurred. Right. Uh, so we try to continue to message to them and also that it's, it's the wave of the future. I remember years ago when squad car a dash cam video oh, first yeah, came right, out. Right. Um, you know, there was a kind of a time, at times some had an adverse reaction sure. to this because it's new technology. Sure. Well, that's, I mean, that's standard. And these body cameras, uh, we're about a year into our full rollout of them, department-wide. Uh, it'll continue to improve. It'll continue to be looked upon as a, as a tool. It's something that our community expects from us. And okay. so... Can they shut them off? Because I was, I think last week or a couple weeks ago, we were talking about some officers that Another place that actually shut, shut their cameras off and they redid some of the footage? 
So one thing about the body camera, so an officer can certainly deactivate the right. camera, mm -hmm. but there had been some talk uh, that others have brought up uh, that officers could somehow manipulate exactly. the, yeah. the video that it was recorded. Right. That they cannot do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they can turn it on, turn it off, but what's recorded, an officer cannot go in there and alter or, or manipulate that recording. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we're we're living in an interesting world where you can get cameras on your glasses. Yeah. You can get you can have a, a pendant and use sure. a camera. Sure. You'll be talking to somebody. They can be treating you uh, because based on your color or mm -hmm. you know or based on your sexual preference. They sure. can talk to you a certain way and and deny it. And so I think yeah. it's I think a lot of that is actually good because it forces people to say, Hey, look. I need to treat people the way I want to be treated. Absolutely, and that's the bottom line. That's right. really the bottom line. So, um, and our communities have wanted us to capture more of those engagers. And we know, as far as technology, just about everyone you run into has a cell phone, and right. and certainly oh, yeah. can record uh, those interactions as well. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So you have a young man sitting there right now. You've been watching Motivation, and mm -hmm. uh, he's looking at you. He's saying, you know, I'd like to be a police officer someday. Yeah. What, what would you tell somebody, uh, whether they're uh, Chinese, African American, a homosexual, whatever, whatever it is, they're interested in becoming a police officer, what would you tell them today? I, I'd Honestly. Also, I'd also mm -hmm. say it could be young women out there or watching young women because as well. yeah. uh, that is a demographic that um, from the 70s and 80s and 90s, it has tapered off in terms mm -hmm. of women entering uh, the profession and I'm certainly reaching out to women leadership within our organization to try to find ways uh, uh, that we can really look at and analyze our recruitment and hiring practices to get more women on and that's a national phenomenon where we're not seeing as many women entering uh, the policing profession. Uh, but that being said, um, I would go back to again, um, more so than ever in our history, mm -hmm. um, Communities are calling for, for change, change for the better in the way uh, we police. And so mm -hmm. uh, with, with some of the laws that are out there, uh, some of the challenges that exist, there's a great deal of opportunity that exists today uh, in this profession. And we need bright young minds and future leaders uh, to really pave the way of what policing is going to look like. I am determined that amidst some of the challenges that are occurring right now in our, our, our city and our country, I'm determined that Minneapolis police will be on the right side of history and we need young men and women to come on and be a part of that and now's the time to do right. that. Great benefits, great to give back to your city. Uh, Minneapolis is, continues to grow in its population. Uh, you know, we just hosted this game called the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of great opportunities, a lot of great positive things that are, uh, that are happening here in this city. And so uh, it's a great place to work. Right. And how, you know, when you have all these people coming, uh, other securities coming in, yeah. how did that affect you guys, your department? You know, you have yeah. everybody, everybody who's here. Absolutely. <laughs> Minneapolis, we were unique when we hosted it this year. Last year, the city of Houston right. hosted the city, uh, the Super Bowl. Uh, they have a department of 5,000 officers. Mm -hmm. So they were able to literally take a couple of thousand of their officers and manage it. Uh, Minneapolis, we don't have that right. many. So it required 60 law enforcement agencies throughout the state of Minnesota, from as far north as Ely, Minnesota, to as far wow. south as Rochester, mm -hmm. uh, federal, local, state. Um, it is a national, they call a SEER 1 event, special events um, uh, assessment rating, uh, which gets the most uh, federal assistance and support. Um, and so we had from our men and women of the National Guard mm -hmm. to our local, to our county deputies, uh, it was really a Minnesota law enforcement public safety effort, and so uh, I was very pleased at the cooperation and relationship. Mm -hmm. But it required, uh, you know, for those uh, oh, yeah. ten days into the Super Bowl, uh, it was a lot of hands-on and and uh, folks roll up their sleeves. But we, I, from a public safety standpoint, uh, if folks just remember the score of the game, we did oh, our yeah. job. And you had very yeah. few incidents. I believe, absolutely, too. yeah, Which absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, what what are you guys doing from the standpoint of building up? citizens trust in the police department. Anything new going on in that end? Are they doing anything on that end? Yeah, so with the Minneapolis Police Department, our procedural justice really focuses on uh, trust. And certainly, you know, my pillars for our department moving forward right. is trust, accountability, and professional service. But 
I know that there has been uh, areas of our community where the trust was shaken or it didn't exist right. before. And so we have to get out of our precincts, we have to get out of City Hall, and we have to go out to the community where they are, meet them in their spaces. And really it's about engaging in those one-on-one -on -one relationships. Right. Yeah. And uh, I've often said that um, um, when something negative happens, um, if the community can give you the benefit of the doubt, that's about building that trust. And so uh, we're doing that. We're doing that whether we're meeting in their places of worship. Yeah. Um, uh, I was just over at uh, Holy Rosary Church in, in South Minneapolis the last Sunday speaking to uh, community members of our undocumented community. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of fear and distress right now of government uh, as it looks upon our undocumented sure. communities. And so it's important. I don't want them to be victimized twice. Right. I don't want anyone from our communities to suffer be a victim of a crime, right. but then also be a victim because they, they don't want to call 911 to report it right. because fear something will Their happen. Fear of, sure. And yeah. so, so we really have to get out and meet them. You mentioned uh, 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 our local heroes, the Adams brothers mm -hmm. uh, on the police department, yeah. uh, uh, both uh, Commander uh, Charles Adams, uh, son, yep. actually his brother, brother. Tony yeah, yeah, Adams, right. and he's got his son, right, no. uh, uh, Officer Adams over at North High School. But um, I mean, the, the things that they do, whether it's our Police Activities League, uh, North High Coaching, mm -hmm. it's just those one-on-one -on -one relationships and really being there to, to mentor and guide and support oh, yeah. uh, the kids, it, it really pays off dividends so yeah. much. Yeah. I agree. You know, I think, there's, I think there's so much to be done when, you, when we're talking about as far as relations, and, and I tell people this, and I'll, I'll say it on motivation mm -hmm. here. I've, and I'm not saying this part to brag, but I got two what it, those certificates they give you when you yeah. get in front of the chief and they give oh, you sure. for helping an officer yep. in need. And, yes, yeah, life saving. I, I helped two officers yeah. out. Do you know why? Yeah. Because even though when I was younger, I was had some mistreatment by police officers. Mm -hmm. I judge people as an individual. I have a lot yeah. of friends that are policemen, and the thing that always moves me, I don't care who it is, if I see somebody that needs help, I'm going to help them. Yeah. Now. If I walk by and there's an officer that's just always bullying people, yeah. I might be less likely to stop and help that guy because yeah. I'm thinking, this joke, he probably deserves yeah, it. Absolutely. Which yeah. might be wrong, but I'm saying it's because I, my attitude is I, I believe in treating people the way I want to be treated. Yeah. And when you build those relationships, and I can start naming officers that I've been friends sure. with for years, best sure. friends of mine that retired, but it's because we had relationships and I was able to see them as an individual. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of police officers out there that have attitudes, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of great police officers out there yeah. of all races out there, and I'll say that, period. There, There is. You hit on a, a great point. Oftentimes when I'm in community settings and I will ask the community, what do you think is the number one complaint against Minneapolis police officers? Many will raise their hand and think it's uh, use of force, right. mm -hmm. um, misconduct, these types of things. And some of them are stunned when I mm -hmm. tell them that the actual biggest complaints we get is language and attitude. Mm -hmm. If we tell our officers to, again, treat people the way you, you want, want to be treated, treated yes. how you approach them, a kind yes. word, yes. Uh, even being able to say you're sorry, um, those are all important in terms of building those relationships. And as you mentioned, you still remember those officers that oh, yeah. you befriended, you had those relationships with. Oh, yeah. And uh, I also say never underestimate the power of a moment. Uh, every interaction that you have, uh, even if it should mean taking someone to jail, if you do that in a respectful way, um, they'll remember that as well. Right, I so, agree, yeah. I agree. And this is, I want to ask you this, this has nothing to do really about Minneapolis, but yeah. the shooting that happened a couple weeks ago or whatever, in the yes. school, Yes. the officers that didn't go forward, how did that make you feel that, this, that they didn't go? Yeah, uh, and, and again, I, I want to be cautious because I don't have all of the facts right, right. yet, I know that's still an ongoing investigation. Yes. Um, but we train our officers here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, we train our law enforcement officers, whether you're the school resource officer, whether you're the district squad that's driving by, um, whether you're off duty and you hear the call come out. We train in these active shooter events that uh, you have to go in, you have to go in timely, and you have to do what you can to neutralize right, the threat. Right, right. And so uh, hesitation, literally kills oh, yeah. and so um, we we will continue to train and we do our officers that in the event we get that horrific call you have to go in there seconds are so valuable to life and we have to neutralize the threat so, right. Yeah. right I like that I like yeah. that last word one thing that would move somebody out there again to yeah. maybe call you guys yeah number one and then number two also do you have a, is there a call line for people that are, if they have, is there, I mean, like tip lines or different things, a way for community members to get involved? 
Yeah, so I would say one, our community service officer program, this is a program designed for, uh, for young men and women who may be kind of on the border of thinking about joining and being a police officer. Um, we pay for your schooling. We also pay a stipend while you come here. And then that's the direct pipeline for us to get you on and hired as a Minneapolis police officer. You get to know the geography of the city uh, and, it's, and it's really great. And also get to know the men and women of the yep. department. Um, I would say if you, if you call, um, 673-3556. If you have any questions about uh, other opportunities within the Minneapolis Police Department, feel free to do so. Right. And are you available to go out and speak? And how do they get a hold of you? Yes, so? uh, the same number. Uh, Nina at our front desk there, six, area code 612-673-3556. And if there's an engagement that's going on in the community and you'd like for uh, myself or a member of my team to come out and talk, uh, we'd be, I'd be more than happy to. Right. Last question, because I know yeah. you're busy. I noticed in one of your, you were, you, they interviewed you and you said, at your swearing in, never to drink from the cup of hate, but just love. What does that look like in your role as, a, as chief of police? I think that that's everything that I do when I come to work each and every day. It's really doing all I can to change the culture of the department for the better. It's truly about service at the end of the day, and it's about those meaningful relationships. Um, we, we need to try to get this right uh, with each encounter and um, and build that trust. So uh, each and every day trying to change the culture. I love your attitude. And by the way, I've met a lot of different people in police departments, and some of them I thought, well, I like to interview that person, and I listened to them and how they interact with people. I thought, I can't interview that person because they were different than, they weren't who they were presenting themselves to okay. be. There was like the two side of them, sure, you know? Sure, uh, it's a, it's a, like public and personal, mm -hmm. and I'm public, but I'm personal, so yeah. the way I'm talking to you right now is the way I'd, I'd be talking to person sure. Caribou. Sure, Okay. Yeah. I'm no different. The way I yeah. am at church is the way I'm here. Mm -hmm. There's no difference, and uh, I think it's important to be genuine people, yeah. but I also know that a position as a police officer, you also, you have to be, you're a person of authority, so that's important as well. Well, the relationships are key, as you mentioned. So. Definitely. Yeah. On that note, I want to do what I always do. I'm going to give you a copy oh, of one great. of my books Thank called you. Fitness and Faith, Balancing the Scales. Thank you uh, very you can read, much. When you get something, when you when you when you're sitting in a squad car, we yes. don't do the okay. squad car anymore. But you got something. I still to read. got a car. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. But I, I want to give that to you. And hope, Thank I hope you that very will much. Bless you. I yes. want to just say that I appreciate you coming on Motivation. Definitely, it's great here in front thank of you. Thank you for having thank me. You. You've done so much for our, our communities for so many years. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, on that note, I'm on, note, I want to just say thanks for tuning in to Motivation. Ron Henderson, aka the Fitness King, with my guest, Minneapolis Chief of Police. Rondo. Yes. We're going to see you Thank next you. time. And all that you do, stay fit, stay motivated, and stay blessed. Thanks. Hi, I'm Bob Wilbanks from Ambassadors for Business, here with today's Motivational Minute. I want to talk to you a little bit about time. You know, it's one of the biggest crunches we have out there. I think business equates to busyness. And it's interesting to me that there's only one difference in between busyness and business, and that's the I and the why. When we spend the time doing business the, the right way with our identity in Him, uh, it all works out. It's business for the glory of God. But when we put ourselves first and we put that why in there, right, it's about me, that's when we start to get mixed up. And at that point in time, we start spending our time on things that are probably more urgent in nature. You know, I gotta have, gotta have, instead of what's ultimate. What's ultimate? What's God's will in our lives? If we start thinking about what's ultimate and set out to do that each and every day, it'll make a huge difference in your life.